served three terms as chair of the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies, three terms on the Academic Senate. He was twice chair of the Senate Curriculum Policy Committee and served on a statewide task force for the CSU Academic Senate on the roles, responsibilities, resources, and rewards for department chairs. He served for many years as a general education fellow, playing an instrumental role in developing the original Gen Ed program in the sophomore seminars. He was chair of the CSU CFA chapter, serving three year terms as an advocate for faculty rights. Here he was strongly committed to curricular innovation. He developed a course on Native American religions and began wrote an internationally known philosophy of religion text called Philosophy of Religion for a Global Perspective. A reviewer of the book said, the selection of primary texts in the account of Native American, African, and Asian religions is outstanding. Gary also produced an introduction of philosophy text, Voices of Wisdom, which soon began, became one of the leading introductory books on philosophy, reaching eight editions. He also published texts on religion, studying religion, an introduction to cases, Eastern ways of being religious, Western ways of being religious, and Shinto ways of being religious, and wrote a major essay entitled The Dalai Lama's View on World Religions. Here he was a very active scholar and was granted a visiting research fellowship at the Center for Studies in Religion and Society at the University of Victoria in 1998. He continued to do research at that center after he retired. Students knew Dr. Kessler or Gary as a creative, challenging, fair, and truly excellent teaching teacher. He loved working individually with students and engaged them in special research projects. He was also a mentor to many of us in the department. In retirement in 2007, Gary moved with his wife Katie to Bellingham, Washington, where he continued his research and writing. In 2007, he published a third edition of Studying Religion through Case Studies, and in 2015, 50 Key Thinkers in Religion. Also, during his retirement, Gary and Katie spent many months in South Africa, working with several animal preserves, as well as engaging in conservation endeavors. He actually served as treasurer of one of those preserved endeavors. Gary was a wonderful colleague. He contributed a great deal both to our students and to this university, and we miss him terribly.
complex spacecraft. Uh, Ed had just finished doing the necessary illumination studies for the joint U.S.-Soviet space missions that were planned. He was driving down from north to south, from Stanford, his alma mater, to Lockheed in the Los Angeles area where he worked. And he said later, uh, as a whim, he, he pulled off I-5 in the middle of nowhere to check out that little college that had an opening in their psychology department. And he never left. <laughs> Two years later, he was chairing that psychology department. And under his leadership, we hired many new faculty. We developed our curriculum. We added graduate programs. We acquired facilities that, that Ed designed and moved into them. We got equipment from National Science Foundation grants that he wrote to support laboratory assignments and, and faculty research. He was so good at department chairing, he was called on to chair five other different departments while he was at the university over the years. Um, during all this, he was supervising student, students who were doing interesting neuroscience research projects under National Science Foundation uh, funding. Many of you who remember Ed remember him in some administrative capacity because he was, he was interim this and acting that of, of almost everything. I uh, have I have the full deck of Ed Suzaki business cards because he would get a new card being an organized man every time he got a new position. So these say things like interim dean of the School of Humanities and Social Sciences, professor of psychology, and so forth. Um, we can't name all those, there's no time. But uh, you might think that since he served in so many different capacities that he was like a placeholder. That was not the way Ed did things at all. While he was Dean of Graduate Studies and Research for several years, which is, now that would be the Grants Research and Sponsor Programs Office, he instituted the Student Research Scholars Program, which we still have. He instituted the very first Student Research Travel Program in the CSU. He developed and implemented all of the federally mandated uh, policies and procedures to protect human and animal subjects in a research setting. And because he had, he was doing some teaching also, but because he had some time on his hands, he also chaired the CSU-wide Council of Deans of Graduate Studies and Research Programs. But his real love was teaching in uh, students. I team taught with Ed our biological psychology course, and I got to see him in action. And uh, we would, it was almost like a ceremony, we would walk together into the classroom, because it was team taught. So we would walk in, Ed would square his shoulders before he went into the classroom, put a smile on his face, and say, good afternoon, students. And they would answer back, and, he was in his element. Uh, he relished working with students, and that's why uh, many professors take laboratory assignments and say, I'll pass those off to my, my teaching assistants because it takes so darn much time. Not it. He relished spending that time with students one-on-one, uh, -on -one, whether it was the proper way to dissect a cow I won't or how to uh, do bioelectric recordings overnight in a sleep laboratory and identify sleep stages. Um, he, he loved his students. He told me one time near the end of his career here that he stayed because he fell in love with students. And, and they loved him back. I was, I was on his retention promotion tenure committees and I was just astounded when I would look at the student evaluations of his teaching because there was never a negative comment. I mean, I can't recall one. Uh, Ed 
tired a few times, <laughs> and the university would call him back. It was, it, it almost seemed like a like a game. It, it was like, so we're going to change over all the data management systems at the university to PeopleSoft. Someone has to lead the way on this. Who can do it? And then somebody would go, I know. We'll get it. to do it. And he would, he would come in, come back out of retirement, and do his thing. Uh, when he passed away in August of 2014, he was just a couple weeks <clears throat> short of what he swore was going to be his real, for sure, absolute, real capital R retirement. Uh, and, and he was, at that time, chairing the sociology department. Um, so, he really never left us. Um, can I get Tanya and Raymond to come up here and do a... Kurt? <laughs> On behalf of their dad. My name is Ray Sasaki, and uh, I think that was just a wonderful uh, introduction or, or an overview of my father. And I don't think I can top that. And I think, that, like in my family, I'm the black sheep, so everything I do kind of brings the, the average down. <laughs> so um, my sister kind of reminded me that I'm the only one, there's three of us, I'm the only one that's not a doctor. So that kind of gives you an idea of. Uh, kind of what I had to, to, to live with. Um, well, all right. I was just going to say thanks, thank you for for honoring my father and the people that came to uh, to do so, as well as uh, all the uh, inductees. Uh, I, I am a magic magician at the Magic Castle, so uh, without taking up too much time, uh, I'll do something like my father loved. He was my number one fan, so I will. Uh, and it, that came from his father. So I guess I'll kind of just trying to see what, how I'm going to split this up. I'll do something here. There's many different ways to uh, pick a card, choose a card. So I won't. Uh, I'll do something. I think that unless you're really into the magic circle, you're not going to see this because, like I said, pick a card, choose a card. I'll give kind of the front and a back, kind of like one, two, three, four, five, six. I'll do six, okay, just because it's, it's easy. But to do six cards, that's a little bit more difficult. Uh, keeping track of one, keeping track of two, but six is a little harder. I'm going to be off the mic, so can everyone hear me? Yeah. All right, so, so here's what we have. Uh, this is a one-handed cut. For those of you who play cards, if it's a little difficult to do. Um, if you master that, you can do one, two one-handed cuts, okay, just like that. This is a one-handed cut with a back flip. A one-handed cut with a front flip is a little bit more impressive looking. It looks something like that. But, um, and if you really get into it, now I probably could have gotten a doctorate for the time it took to do this. <laughs> See, I, that's a one-handed shuffle, and we can see it right now. So um, I'm going to, let's see, let's, let's do, um, uh, yeah, all right. So I'm going to give each one of you guys a, a card. So again, one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm going to go to different parts of the deck, okay? So we're going to go to the middle of the deck, and this is going to be, your cards. You got, got that? Alright, so then we're going to go to the top of the deck. And can you guys see that? Got it? Right, 
received several NSF grants in a very competitive research division where only about 5% of those grants are awarded. And most notably, he, in 1988, wrote a paper that proved the singer rumor conjecture. Uh, that was an open problem in mathematics since 1955. And he wrote the proof that proved that conjecture. And as a result of that publication, he was invited to many prestigious universities. I'm not going to name all of them, but just a few big names. Uh, Oxford, Leeds University, UC Berkeley, UCLA, and many others of that caliber to talk about his research. So we were very fortunate to have him here as a top-notch mathematics researcher at CSU Bakersfield. Uh, with respect to the computer science and engineering departments, as I said, he was just foundational in the formation of those departments. I have several of my colleagues here that can attest to the fact that our department would not be what it is today without the dedication and effort that Mark put into not only the programs, but you know, forming the faculty, mentoring the students, and just being such a part of our program for so many years. Uh, the curriculum that he developed is still in use today by faculty members. Obviously, it's been updated for the modern times, but they're still using it in operating systems and networking. Uh, just to give a little anecdote, I actually was a student here before I went off to graduate school to become a, a faculty member. And when I was a student, Mark taught our a digital circuits class. And I can remember all of us being in there just kind of astounded by how brilliant he was at digital circuits. Here's a mathematician who's teaching an engineering class and knowing every single thing he's talking about, every single diagram was detailed, and we're furiously writing on our papers, trying to keep up with him as he's writing all these circuit diagrams on the whiteboard, and just going, you know, mile a minute. And then one of the students got a digital camera, which in the 1990s was a luxury item to have a digital camera. And we were thrilled. We're like, we're going to become best friends with this student because he has a digital camera and he can record all these intricate diagrams that Mark is putting up on the whiteboard that we're trying to frantically write down on paper. And that just gives you an idea as a student how uh, impactful he was on my career. And just in general, he was well regarded by the students. Uh, there was a, a kind of a joke or a meme that our students had that if Mark was an academic superhero, his superpower would be to divide by zero, which from <laughs> a mathematical perspective is a possibility. And as I was speaking with one of the former students who's now a faculty member the other day, we were talking about Mark, and he had said not only would he figure out how to divide by zero, but he would explain it in such a way that I would then know how to divide by zero at that point too. And so he's just, it was just a real force to be reckoned with within our department. And when we talk about the engineering programs, I honestly believe that if it were not for Mark's efforts and dedication and sheer force of will to get those programs started, we probably would not have the AVET accredited engineering programs that we have today. It was really his dedication to electrical and computer engineering that got those programs off the ground and that gave a nice foundation that the department was able to pick up with and move on from after he retired. And uh, one other little antidote here, which the faculty member will know, Mark, for many, many years, also worked as the system administrator for our department. So not only was a top-notch mathematical researcher and a great academic and a, a teacher and a mentor, he also did a staff job, essentially, as doing system administration for the department. And he would run this land watch, uh, which is a way of looking for attackers attacking the networks, which back in the 80s and 90s, not many people knew what an attacker was. They didn't know what's a hacker, what's a cyber attacker, what's cyber attacks, what's cyber security. But Mark was on the cutting edge of that. He would notice things before campus IT would notice it. He would let people know what's going on. He would get annoyed when people didn't quite understand the magnitude of what he was trying to tell them. It's like, wait, they're trying to attack our networks. We should stop this. We should prevent this. But just at the time frame, it wasn't really a, a big impact on the systems there. Uh, just to kind of wrap up things, as I said, we really do miss Mark, and we're very glad that his family's here to join us today. His sister, brother-in-law, and nephew have joined us today from the Bay Area for this induction. Uh, one, of the, one more final antidote, which is that even after Mark retired, he was still active in the department. He would log into our department server on almost a daily basis 
and he would be keeping an eye on things, and Steve Garcia, who's our current system administrator, and myself would get emails all the time about things that weren't working quite right, or things that weren't working at all. One time he even had to manually edit the school file, which is how you would normally have a system sent you an email, but he just handcrafted an email to myself and Steve because the system wasn't working, the email program wasn't working, and he wanted us to know because he knew that the semester, or at that point it was the quarter, he knew the quarter was starting in two days, and there's something wrong with the, the server, and we, even though he wasn't teaching, so I'd be ready for the students when the quarter started that Monday. And he handcrafted this message to Steve and I on Friday night to let us know, hey, there's something wrong with the server. You guys need to look into it. And that's just how dedicated he was to this campus, that even after he retired, he logged in, he kept an eye on things, he kept us up to date, and he made sure that everything was going forward well for the students and for the, the department as a whole. So I'm very honored to uh, have nominated Mark Thomas with the full unanimous support of the Computer Science Department for this award.
actually faculty member, but rather as a quiet performer. Early in her career, the small number of faculty was required to fill numerous roles, and she led on many fronts with grace, poise, diplomacy, and a commitment to strengthen student education. And this is important, I think, in particular, as the only female faculty of the history department for 13 years, she broke ceilings and established trails for future women faculty, including uh, me and other female colleagues in my department. Most notably, she led the history department as chair for 12 years. That was two six-year um, periods, mentoring numerous young faculty in the process and providing significant support for the Public History Institute in its earliest years. In addition, she worked as coordinator of the Single Subject Teacher Preparation Program for Social Studies for 20 years, developing at least two brand new programs that required CTCC approval. In teaching, she excelled at engaging students in her field, which was early modern Europe, especially in her specializations of the Renaissance and the Reformation. She helped her students understand the historical context for the art and architecture of this period, as well as the revolutions that convulsed more than one continent. She further helped them navigate the role and influence of religion in this period, including its fiery theological debates. She engaged young minds with the critical use of scholarly texts while holding her students to high standards. Her reputation for rigor is well known and motivated, and motivated students met the challenge by working hard to, to excel. She emphasized strong writing and taught many sections of our historical writing course as well as senior seminar. Her efforts in improving student writing through analytical essays, research papers, and so on were significant. If one mark of true leadership is disavowal of special privileges, the evidence demonstrates that Dr. Harry abided by this philosophy over her long career, fully engaging in her responsibilities by teaching a wide array of courses in general education, including survey courses, in seminars in her field, and at the graduate level. This view of Dr. Harry's influence on our students is echoed by one of our alums who states, Dr. Harry's lectures and reading assignments prompted lively class discussions, which she moderated with equanimity. She stressed the importance of critical thinking through reading and writing. This may appear elementary, but for some of us, it was a new intellectual challenge. Her classes revealed biases of which I was unaware, and she inspired me to consider various points of view objectively. Critically evaluating source material as well as writing history in the context of balance and rational argument is not only useful in scholarly pursuits, but it is a comprehensive life skill. The same student added that Dr. Jean Harry inspired me to seek a graduate degree in history and to complete a thesis in early modern English history. I am grateful for her encouragement and support. Dr. Harry has remained an active scholar, publishing articles and presenting at conferences. She received some 12 research awards, including two National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowships, and her research has appeared in major peer-reviewed journals in her field. Since you probably don't know these, I'll just leave it at that. She further compiled a long list of published book reviews. And even in retirement, she remained an active scholar recently presenting her current research project at the department's historical research group and having her paper accepted for presentation at January's meeting of the American Historical Association in Chicago. Perhaps more than anything else, Dr. Harry contributed heavily to the functioning of this university over her very long career, developing what can only be called an extraordinary record of service. Highlights include department chair, as I mentioned, single subject coordinator, as I said, and also numerous administrative search committees, the University Review Committee, assistant dean in the School of Arts and Sciences twice, chair of numerous committees, including the GE Task Force, IRB, GIAC, and Women's Studies, as well as numerous school and campus committees. Since she's retired, she has even volunteered to work in the archives in the Historical Research Center of her library. These 
His many varied experiences in service made Dr. Harry invaluable to the department and the university. Her institutional memory and understanding the ins and outs of university life administration helped the department navigate program reviews, threats of moratorium, and myriad new projects such as curriculum changes in conjunction with the transition to semesters. And for all these reasons, I think she's so deserving of being inducted, so I'm of course delighted that she is. And on a personal note, I want to add that uh, having her in the department, and she had been in the department for 15 years when I came, was an incredible asset. Uh, I found her to be a most encouraging and helpful mentor to me, and I'm so fortunate to have been her colleague and proud now to be her friend. Thank you.
She visited uh, uni universities in many countries like Me Mexico, Costa Rica, France, Italy, Germany, Russia, Great Britain, Spain, and many others. Furthermore, she invited guests from UCLA, San Diego State University, Monterey Institute of Forensic um, Studies, Defense Language Institute, and many others to illustrate students at CSUB with her knowledge and with her knowledge and exper expertise on different Spanish literature, uh, literature topics. It is worth to mention that Dr. Coral always had an outstanding way to enhance learning inside and outside the classroom. She dedicated her own time to organize and fundraise many field trips for more than a hundred students at a time. She took uh, these students to local and outside of town museums, concerts, literature, cla um, classic theater plays, symphonic orchestra, Tijuana's cultural Hispanic American centers, and even to Europe on her own time. In addition, she was the founder of the Club Literario Elmers here at CSUB. The mission of the club, Elmers, was to raise awareness and appreciation of the Hispanic language and culture within our community. Each year, Club Elmers used to publish a bilingual journal or literary work from CSUB students and other universities, including essays, poetry, short studies, Hayaka and other creative literature work. I personally would like to express my gratitude to her, um, to Dr. Ella Corral for her dedication, teaching, appreciation, and counsel to her students, and the life value that uh, she always preached with her example. Thank you, Dr. Corral. I definitely want to say a few words. I am so happy to see all of you here. The first thing I want to do is to thank God for the opportunities that he gave me in life. Also, my parents, and my professors, my teachers. I grew up in Mexico City, and at the University of Mexico, I had fantastic professors. Some very, very good, well-known writers were my professors there. And then I came to San Diego State, and it was wonderful again. But I was going to be an accountant. <laughs> uh, and so I studied accounting, and I finished. And this will tell you how young I am. Um, at that time, women were not very welcome in the field. And so I felt left out, and it, it was difficult. And all my life I wanted to do literature. So in Spanish you say, contar cuentas, which is to do accounting, and contar cuentos, which means to do literature. And I chose to contar cuentos. And my field came, of course, literature. I was very fortunate to come to CSUB. And at that time, when I graduated, there were no openings for people in the humanities. And so I was just lucky to be hired, while many of my fellow students who graduated were not able to, to find work. But I didn't want to come to Bakersfield. <laughs> and they gave me a going away party, uh, arts, uh, 
at San Diego State and at USC where I received my PhD. And they say, guess where she's going? <laughs> anyway, so um, I came here, but one of my professors told me something that I have never forgotten. He said, you are going to a new university and you will have plenty of opportunity to do so many things because in big, big places, everything is taken. But you will have the opportunity to do many things. And you know, that was the case. I was able to do many, many things and, and, and work with students. They came to my place and we worked together and we published books and we did field trips and I founded clubs and I just, you know, and I had them write and read and, and, and then I had shows at the theater every time, shows and publications and we really did a lot of wonderful, wonderful things. And I'll never forget that. And I am so happy to see here my dear friends from the university who always supported me. And also um, my students and I see uh, so many of you that I love so dearly. I really, really love you. And I thank you for all you did for me. Now, I'm just going to finish on a, on a note. Uh, could I have a bag that I have right there? Um, I want, many times I would give a, a final exams and my students would say, Dr. Corral, is it going to be very hard? And I said, no, 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 Mickey Mouse. <laughs> well, Maribel mentioned that when I met her lately, and she said, I remember when you used to say Mickey Mouse, and it was no Mickey Mouse. <laughs> but, <laughs> but one of my students, and this is a sad note, he passed away in January, but he brought me a gift one day, and I want to present it to Maribel, who recommended me today. And let me show you what it is. Thank you. 
congratulate them on behalf of the class of 2018. Congratulations. Think about the diversity of these two classes. We represent so many different disciplines. But there's one thing we have in common. One thing that we have in common as professors, that we are dedicated to our students, number one. Secondly, to our disciplines, our individual disciplines. If you look at each one, you see that is the case. And thirdly, to this great university that has given us so much. So once again, congratulations. Welcome to the club. <laughs> look forward to seeing you on the wall. It's been kind of lonely up there this past day. <laughs> Thank you.